Hello, everyone, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, we're bringing you the latest breaking news, cutting edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty, staff, and alumni. Today, we have Dave Rand joining us. Dave is the Associate Professor of Management Science and Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT Sloan. Bridging the fields of behavioral economics and psychology, Professor Rand's research combines mathematical and computational models with human behavioral experiments to understand human behavior. His work uses a cognitive science perspective grounded in the tension between more intuitive versus deliberative modes of decision making. He explores such topics as cooperation and prosociality, punishment and condemnation, perceived accuracy of false or misleading news stories, political preferences, and the dynamics of social media platform behavior. Prior to MIT, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University, and he taught at both Harvard and Yale. He joined the faculty here in 2018, and we are thrilled to have him on the program today to tell us more about his work on misinformation and fake news. Dave, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, and I will share your slides. Great. Uh, so uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be able to be here and tell you a little bit about the, uh, the work that I've been doing recently on trying to understand misinformation uh, and, you know, um, as I said, why we fall for it and what to do about it. So as I'm sure all of you uh, have heard, if you've been watching any news for the last two and a half years, uh, there's been a really big surge in interest in this problem, which is uh, it's a very old problem, like misinformation has been around pretty much as long as information has been around, but uh, sort of the 2016 presidential election in the US and the Brexit uh, vote in the UK brought uh, a certain kind of partisan or political fake news and misinformation uh, really into the spotlight, in large part because of social media and the way that social media has sort of changed um, news dissemination and news consumption. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today is trying to understand uh, why people believe the kind of uh, partisan misinformation that's on social media and what can be done about it, particularly by social media platforms. So I'm going to start with some definitions, uh, which is when I say fake news, I'm not talking about anything that I disagree with, which is a definition that some people have been using these days, uh, but rather I talk about fake news or false news, I mean entirely fabricated stories presented as if they were actual legitimate news source, uh, stories. <clears throat> and this is, uh, as I was mentioning, I think something that has gotten a lot of attention recently and where the lion's share of the focus has been. But there's another kind of misinformation uh, that has gotten a lot less attention that I think is probably actually a much bigger problem. And so I'm interested in both of these things. Uh, the alternative being what we call hyperpartisan news. So this is biased or misleading uh, reporting and interpretation of events that did actually happen. So it's not entirely fabricated, it's just uh, misleading with a particular uh, partisan slant. The questions then that uh, I'm interested in are first of all, a sort of basic science question of why is it that people believe misinformation? What determines the kind of information people believe? And then the more applied question of what we can do in light of that understanding to fight the spread of misinformation. So I'm gonna start with the basic science question. Uh, and there's one dominant narrative that I feel like has really taken over both in the academic uh, discussion and in the uh, popular press and popular discussion more generally, which is captured by uh, a, a, this set of headlines, things like the real story about fake news is partisanship or the partisan brain. Uh, you know, facts alone can't fight false beliefs things like that. And the way that I would summarize this perspective is the reason people believe things that are pretty obviously not true and it, it seems like they should be able to figure out are not true is because people are not using their reasoning abilities to uncover the truth. Instead, people are mostly using their reasoning abilities to just defend their identities and protect their pre-commitments and justify the things that they already believed. And so this is what we call motivated reasoning because the idea is your reasoning is being hijacked by other motivations like partisan uh, motivations. And you know, this does seem like a compelling account, uh, but what we set out to do was to try and actually empirically test this using experiments and see if there is in fact support 
for this motivated uh, view, or if instead there's uh, support for a more kind of classical view, what we call classical reasoning, which suggests that when you engage in reasoning, it does actually help you figure out the truth. And the problem on social media is just that people aren't thinking enough, aren't engaging in reasoning. So to distinguish between these two possibilities, we've run a series of experiments that looked at the relationship between how good people are at discerning the truth of the news that they read and the extent to which they engage in analytic thinking. And the reason this is the key relationship is these two different accounts of falling for fake news make opposite predictions here. If it's about motivated reasoning and your reasoning ability is getting hijacked by your partisan biases, then you should actually expect a negative correlation between media truth discernment and analytic thinking because people that engage in more thinking are better able to trick themselves. They're better able to talk themselves into believing false stories that are concordant to their ideology, that is that they're motivated to believe, and they're better at talking themselves out of believing true stories that are discordant, that don't align with their ideology, and that they don't want to believe. The classical reasoning account, on the other hand, should pretty straightforwardly uh, predicts a positive correlation where people that engage in more thinking are just better at uh, determining the truth of what they're reading. And now, as I've said, uh, with my colleagues, I've run uh, many experiments, scores of experiments at this point, uh, assessing this relationship. I'm just going to tell you about one that cap is sort of representative. Um, in this particular experiment, we got 485 Americans recruited from an online uh, platform called Lucid. Uh, and this set of participants matched the national distribution in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, and geographic region. And then we had each person indicate whether they thought 30 different headlines were accurate. Now, these are all headlines that we actually took from social media. Um, we only showed them the headline because research suggests that on social media, most of the time, people only read the headline anyways, which you probably also, through a little introspection, uh, may find to resonate. And then in order to see how good they were at discerning the truth uh, of the content that they were reading, uh, we showed them six different types of headlines, five of each type. So uh, a third of the headlines were just blatantly false, as rated by Snopes, a fact-checking organization. A third of them were hyper-partisan, so things that Snopes would give like a mixed rating to, where there is some uh, element of truth, but it's misrepresented. And then a third of them are just straightforward true reporting. And then also half of them are Democrat consistent. That is things that if they were true, they would be good for the Democrats. The other half, if they were true, they would be good for the Republicans. As determined by a pretest, we asked a separate set of people, if this headline was true, who would it be good? Okay, so what we do is we present the headlines as they would have appeared on social media. So sort of in Facebook format, there's a picture, uh, a title, and a lead sentence. Um, we do not show the source in this particular experiment to show that you know, because we don't want people just relying on the source. We want them actually evaluating the headline. And then we ask them, do you think this headline describes an event that actually happened in an accurate and unbiased way? So if it's a fake news story, they said should, they should say no because it didn't actually happen. If it's a hyperpartisan story, they said should say no because it's not accurate and unbiased. Whereas if it's just a true vanilla story, they should say yes. So this question is supposed to uh, separate out the high quality news content from either of the types of misinformation. Okay, so based on the responses there, we can get a sense of how good they are at discerning the truth of the content that they read. Then we also want to assess uh, how much reasoning they're engaging in. And in order to do, to do that, we use something called the cognitive reflection test, uh, which is this widely used test from behavioral economics and cognitive psychology that involves a series of questions that have intuitively compelling but wrong answers. Uh, so, for example, consider this question. When you're running a race and you pass the person in second place, what place are you in? Now, for most people, first place uh, immediately pops into your head, and you might just write it down, but you might stop and think for a second and be like, oh, wait, no, actually, now you're in second place. And the idea is you don't have to be very smart to figure out the answer. It's not hard. It's just a question of do you bother to think or do you just write down the first thing that pops into your head? So we use the fraction of uh, questions on the CRT that people get correctly as a measure of the extent to which they choose to engage uh, in thinking, careful thinking, versus just going with their gut. So the key question for us then is, what is the relationship between 
the fraction of questions that people get correct on the cognitive reflection test, which we'll see on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, and the fraction of headlines of each type that the participant rated as accurate and unbiased, which you'll see on the vertical y-axis. And also I'm gonna say that the size of the dots is proportional to the number of people uh, in each of those different bins of cognitive re reflection test performance. And remember, if it's about motivated reasoning and your reasoning ability is getting hijacked by partisanship, then we would expect that people that did better on the cognitive reflection test would be worse at discerning true from false or hyperpartisan because they're better at tricking themselves. Whereas if it's about classical reasoning, then it's just people that did better on the cognitive reflection test should be better at discerning. And what we find is very much in line with the classical reasoning hypothesis and not at all in line with the motivated reasoning hypothesis. As you'll see here, uh, people who did better on the cognitive reflection test, they were somewhat more likely to rate true stories as accurate and unbiased, and they were substantially less likely to rate either hyperpartisan or false stories as accurate. So basically just the more thinking people were engaging in, the better they were at identifying uh, the accuracy of the content that they were reading. Now, as I'll show you on the next slide, this is equivalent regardless of whether the headlines align with the person's ideology or not, so whether they were motivated to believe or not. And also, you can control for all different kinds of other things that you might wonder about. So this relationship isn't actually about age or gender or education or ideology, liberal versus conservatism, or the degree of political knowledge, or just kind of raw uh, math, uh, sort of raw mental ability, which we capture using a numerical, like a, basically a series of hard math tests. Uh, you can account for all of those things, and you still see this relationship where people that are more likely to stop and think are better at telling true from false. But that's not to say that there's no partisan bias. So on this next slide, I'm showing you exactly the same thing, but now I'm splitting between uh, headlines that align with the participant's ide ideology, which you can see in the solid colors, and headlines that didn't align with the, part with the person's ideology, which you can see in the hashed colors. So you see for all, different, uh, for all three different types of content, people do believe the headlines that align with their ideology a bit more than the headlines that don't. But that's just a totally independent effect from the fact that engaging in more reasoning makes you better able to tell the truth of the content. So regardless of whether it aligns with your ideology or not, people that did better on the CRT are less likely to believe the misinformation. Um, and also, just the difference in ratings between true versus hyperpartisan or false are a lot bigger than the differences between the politically concordant or discordant. So although partisan bias does have some influence, when you ask people to judge accuracy, the actual accuracy of the content has a much bigger impact on their judgments uh, than the partisanship uh, or the partisan alignment. So this is all evidence that, uh, that supports the classical reasoning account of falling from misinformation, but uh, a limitation of all of that work is it's done in the context of survey experiments where people know that they're doing a study and they're being asked about accuracy, so they're really focusing on that. And so you might wonder, does this extend into how people actually interact with content in the wild? Uh, and in order to assess that, um, we recruited uh, a set of people and we had them complete the cognitive reflection test. And then we also had them give us their Twitter ID so we could go and look at the actual content that they had been sharing uh, on social media prior to doing the study. And so uh, in this particular sample, it's a majority of people from the United Kingdom. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the distribution of uh, the quality of the news sources that the people were tweeting, where here quality is judged by ratings from a set of third party fact checkers. We had 60 different news sites that we had the third party fact checkers rate. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for now, the idea is I can look at all of the tweets that contained links to one of these 60 sites, and I can then say, what was the quality uh, of that link? And what I'm going to show you is that distribution for people that did poorly on the CRT will be in yellow, and people that did well on the CRT who engage in more thinking, who you'll see in blue. Uh, and what you can see from this is uh, the majority of tweets 
from both low and high CRT people in this particular data set were actually quite high quality. So that top quality bin of 0.9 has most of the uh, most of the, the density is there. So you know something like more uh, about a half of the tweets from the low CRT people and about two thirds of the tweets from the high CRT people are from high quality news sources. But there also is this big difference where the high CRT people are sharing much higher, much more high quality news than the low CRT people. And uh, because the subjects here were from the United Kingdom and uh, our fact checker ratings were uh, based on mostly US based um, news outlets for various other reasons uh, that, I'll, that I'll discuss later, this effect turns out to be uh, driven almost entirely by two websites. So the high CRT people the people that engage in reasoning are substantially more likely to retweet links to BBC, whereas the low CRT people that more go with their gut and their intuition are substantially more likely to retweet links from the Daily Mail, which maybe in accords with some of your intuitions. Uh, but the point here is the thing that we've observed in these lab studies uh, also extends into real sharing in the real world. Once again, you can control for age, gender, education, ideology, country of residence, and sort of raw numerical ability, and it doesn't change this relationship basically at all. And you can then also do some other kinds of analyses of the content of what these people are tweeting. In addition to the quality of news sources, we see lots of other differences, like the high CRT people are more likely to uh, tweet about uh, and follow accounts related to science and politics, and to some extent satire, uh, whereas the low CRT people are more likely to tweet about and follow uh, popular musicians and get-rich-quick schemes on the internet, like internet uh, get-rich-quick schemes. So putting all of this uh, evidence together, it suggests using both lab studies and actual Twitter data that this account about partisanship hijacking our reasoning abilities is not actually right. And instead of motivated reasoning, the problem is more about people just not bothering to engage in reasoning in the first place. Uh, and you know, I think in some sense, this is an optimistic conclusion because I feel like if it's about motivated reasoning, then the only way you're gonna get things to be better is to get people to be less partisan. And that seems really hard. Whereas just getting people to think a little bit more seems like a more tractable problem to me. Um, and it is a really a serious problem, um, particularly in terms of what circulates on social media, because we also have a set of studies that shows that even if you're a smart, reflective person, if you get repeatedly exposed to the same statement, you tend to believe it more. This is a really well-known effect. I think propagandists have known this forever. Um, but we show that it's true even for these kinds of really hyper-partisan and pretty unbelievable uh, false news stories. Um, and so this is looking only at the, the fraction of false stories that are rated as accurate. Um, and so if, if we just show people a set of these stories and say how accurate do you think they are, about 18% of them are rated as accurate. Um, and then we compare it to stories where everything is the same, but at the beginning of the study, we have them look at some of the headlines first in some other context, so that when we ask them if it's accurate or not, they've already seen those stories once before. And we find that just reading the story once five minutes earlier produces a pretty substantial increase in the fraction of headlines that people rate uh, as accurate. And uh, I think perhaps surprisingly, we find that this is even true if when we familiarize you with the story, so when we show you the story in some other context, there's a warning on it saying that it's been disputed by third party fact checkers. It's still the case that people believe the ones that they've seen with the warning label more than, than the stories that they haven't seen before at all. And so again, uh, this is true across the board. It doesn't matter whether you have a motivation to disbelieve the story or not. So for example, Clinton supporters reading false statements about Clinton during the 2016 campaign, this data suggests that they would become more likely to believe those statements, even though they don't want to believe them. We did a one week follow up and the, the effects were still evident. We also found that exposure compounded, the effect compounded over multiple exposures. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, although being reflective helps you better able, uh, makes you better able to 
identify the veracity of content in general, it doesn't actually protect you from this exposure uh, effect. I think that it's probably because the more attentive, reflective people uh, are also more likely to remember having seen it. Um, so, you know, that kind of amps up the effect for them. Okay, so the question then is, uh, if the reason people are believing uh, false content is to a large extent because they're not thinking and they're sort of being driven by these low-level cognitive mechanisms, the question is, what can we do to fight misinformation, and in particular to fight the spread of misinformation on social media? So I'll start with the place that Facebook also started immediately or shortly after the election when people started um, complaining about uh, fake news on, on Facebook, which is they take a false story like this and they put a little warning saying disputed by third party fact checkers. Now, the first problem here is I think that the warning is much too, uh, much too small and sort of, I don't think probably a lot of people really notice it, but there's a much more uh, systemic problem here, which is just this approach isn't scalable. There's no way that professional uh, fact checkers are ever gonna be able to keep up with the stream of misinformation being generated all the time. because It's way easier to, to create false content than it is to go and carefully fact check it. And so what that means is the approach just isn't that effective because many, if not most, false stories never wind up getting flagged. And even the ones that do, it takes a while. So when the story is during it, when the story is in sort of peak virality spreading phase, it's typically not going to have a warning on it. Furthermore, we identified an additional uh, problem of this approach, which we called the implied truth effect. Uh, what we found is that if you put warnings uh, on some false stories, it sort of it suggests to people that all of the untagged stories may have been checked and validated. And so we showed that uh, attaching warnings to some false stories made those stories be believed a bit less, but it made the untagged false stories be believed a bit more. And if we think most stories aren't going to wind up getting tagged, this is potentially really very problematic. And finally, the last problem here is this doesn't address hyperpartisan content because usually this is the only flagging content that fact checkers say is really blatantly false, which again, I'm not sure is really the biggest part of the problem. So I think that approach is not really uh, that great. Um, then we assess another uh, potential um, intervention, which uh, I think Facebook had been considering and a lot of people have been talking about, which is in the default presentation, which you see here, the news source is indicated, but in a way that is sort of minimizes the chance that anyone possibly pays attention to it. It's just a little light gray text in the lower uh, left corner of the story. Uh, and so we're like, well, maybe part of the reason people are believing false content is because they're not realizing that it's from a disreputable source or not believing true content because they don't realize it's from a reputable source. So we're like, what happens if you add a big banner across the bottom? And so to assess this, we tested about 2,000 Americans, um, where we showed them, again, a series of either false or true headlines, all taken from actual headlines from social media. We looked at the fraction of, this, of the headlines they judged to be accurate. And we compared the control, where the things were just presented as normal, with this condition where we put the big banner with the logo uh, across the bottom, which is in purple, controls in yellow. And as you can see, it really had absolutely no effect at all. And we looked at all different subgroups. We kind of sliced the data every way we could think of, and they really, it just didn't do anything, which we found very surprising. Um, and we have some other experiments that have replicated this result and also found that hiding the, the source entirely doesn't really have any effect. And so we were trying to figure out what was going on here. And our first guess, uh, which as you'll see, turned out to be wrong. Uh, our first guess was, well, maybe it seems like in this day and age, people just don't trust reputable news outlets any more than they trust kind of crazy uh, random website outlets. Um, and so we're like, hmm, well, I guess we should look into that. And right around the same time that we were thinking to ourselves that it seemed like maybe people didn't trust uh, reputable news outlets anymore, uh, Facebook announced that their new approach was going to be, they were going to survey people about how much they trusted news outlets, and then they were going to promote content from the outlets that people uh, said that they trusted. And a reporter called me up, said, hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, uh, well, seems like a pretty terrible idea for various reasons that I'll go into on the next slide. But, uh, and then I was like, oh, well, actually, though, it's an empirical question. 
why don't we just run an experiment and find out? So uh, that's what we did. But just to unpack the idea a little bit more uh, before I, I get into the empirical part, the idea is that you can use crowdsourcing to identify good versus bad, uh, or so let's say reliable versus unreliable news outlets. And so the idea is you select a, a set of platform users and you ask them how much they trust a variety of news sources. And an important part here is it's like a polling or market research thing where you say to someone, hey, complete this survey. It's not like Reddit or Yelp where people can upvote or downvote different uh, outlets because that is an extremely easily gamed uh, setting. Um, but so the idea is you pick a random set of people, you uh, solicit their opinions, and then you have the social media ranking algorithm that it determines what stories people get shown. Say, if this story is from a trusted outlet, make it more likely to be shown. Or if this story is from a distrusted outlet, make it less likely to be shown. So again, the idea here is not attaching a label saying, watch out, this is a low quality source or a high quality source, but rather the idea is to, in, is to take the crowd judgment and use it as an input into the ranking algorithm of the social media platform such that content from distrusted outlets just doesn't really get seen as much. Now, if this worked, what would be nice about it is that it's scalable. So unlike you know, professionals fact-checking headlines here, it's easy to recruit large numbers of lay people to give their trust ratings and by rating at the level of the source instead of the headline, there's less of a problem with keeping up. Um, and also, although this still does essentially involve some degree of censorship, you're not having some centralized authority deciding what to censor and what not to censor. Uh, it's, it's this kind of crowd uh, judgment. But uh, there are reasons to think that this may not work. So for example, you may be worried that lay people, uh, if their judgments are clouded by partisanship, that they're gonna wind up saying that they trust the most partisan outlets uh, that validate their beliefs rather than the most accurate outlets, so that this could uh, select for the bias of the crowd rather than the wisdom of the crowd. You might also be worried that lay people are just bad at assessing the accuracy of content, uh, and that's why we have a whole problem in the first place. And if people knew what was a good outlet or good content, then they just wouldn't be sharing it anyways. And third, you might worry that lay people are unfamiliar with most outlets, so how are they supposed to have informed judgments? And again, as I said, a reporter called me, I had all these concerns, and then we were like, oh, let's just run some experiments and find out. So we ran uh, a few of these experiments, but I'm just gonna show you one. They all give similar results. In this one, we recruited 970 Americans, again, that are uh, match the natural distribution of age, gender, ethnicity, and geographic region. And we had them uh, indicate their trust in 60 different news uh, outlets, uh, 20 of which were mainstream media, taken from a Pew list of highest traffic websites uh, among in the US, um, 20 of which were hyper-partisan outlets, and 20 of which were fake news outlets, which we got by taking lists that other uh, journalists and academics had put together um, and saying if, a, if an outlet appeared on at least two lists of hyper-partisan outlets, it was probably hyper-partisan. If it appeared on at least two fake news lists, it was probably fake news. And then we picked the sites that had the largest number of unique Twitter uh, URLs, so the ones that were kind of generating the most content and engagement. Um, and then again, for each one, we had the participants rate uh, how much they trusted it. And so what I'm gonna show you in this figure is I'm gonna split apart the trust ratings of the Democrat, which I'm gonna show on the horizontal x-axis, versus the Republicans, which I'm gonna show on the vertical uh, y-axis. So things in the upper right corner are trusted by both Democrats and Republicans. Things in the lower left corner are trusted by neither Democrats nor Republicans. Things in the lower right corner are trusted by Democrats more than Republicans, and upper left is Republicans and not Democrats. Okay, so here we go, one dot per outlet. Here are the results, and we labeled the ones that more than a third of the participants said they were familiar with. Uh, so the first thing that may jump out to you is a very clear partisan difference where Fox News uh, is kind of an island unto itself, um, where it's essentially the only news outlet that the Republicans had any substantial amount of trust in. So they, Republicans trusted Fox much more than any other news source. And this is a thing that other people have uh, found before. Also, it's a pretty well-established feature of the current uh, media ecosystem. Um, whereas every single other mainstream outlet was trusted by Democrats more than Republicans, even right-leaning things like the Wall Street Journal. Um, so, okay, that's observation number one. But the more important thing 
is that every single one of the hyperpartisan and fake outlets got very low trust ratings. Um, so it doesn't look like the trust ratings were hijacked by, by partisanship. So for example, Breitbart, which is a you know, highly right-leaning hyperpartisan site, um, you can see it uh, there with labels, one of the, the more trusted of the hyperpartisan sites. So even though the Republicans trust Fox News more than they trust Washington Post, CNN, New York Times, MSNBC, they trust all of those mainstream sources more than they trust Breitbart. And similarly, even though the Democrats trust Fox News less than most of the other mainstream sources, they trust it more than any of the left-leaning hyperpartisan sites like Daily Kos. And so what this means is if you were to construct a politically balanced layperson rating by equally rating Democrats and Republicans, so nobody can, should be able to complain of, bar, of, of bias in the selection of, of outlets, in the judgment of outlets, this poli uh, politically balanced layperson rating results in every single mainstream outlet getting a better score than every single fake or hyperpartisan outlet. Um, and so uh, then to get uh, some ground truth on our uh, our you know assignment of news source type. We also recruited a set of professional fact checkers to complete the same survey and indicate how much they trusted those same 60 news outlets. So on the, now on the x-axis, I'm going to show the trust ratings from the fact checkers, and on the y-axis, I'm going to show our politically balanced layperson trust rating. And what you see is there's an extremely high correlation between the layperson ratings and the fact checker ratings. To be honest, this is the highest correlation I've ever found in any study I've ever run. Um, and the thing that drives it is basically that nobody, neither the Democrats, nor the Republicans, nor the fact checkers, uh, gave high trust ratings to any of the fake or hyperpartisan uh, sites. So basically the high correlation is because there's high distrust of the, of the, low, uh, the sort of more questionable uh, outlets. Whereas there's actually substantial disagreement both among Democrats and Republicans and fact checkers over within the mainstream category, which mainstream uh, sources are better or worse than others. That's kind of up for debate, but there's pretty clear consensus around the low quality so, uh, sites being distrusted. And so what that means is it's probably not a good idea for the social media platforms to promote content from trusted outlets, because there's disagreement on what is trusted. But what makes more sense is for them to downrank or demote content from uh, sources that people give low trust values to, because there seems to be a general agreement on what a distrusted source is. Now, another thing you might worry about is if Facebook uh, would actually to implement this, and people would know that their responses would therefore influence what content people see, they might game their responses. And even though they don't trust uh, hyperpartisan content that or sources that align with their ideology, they might say that they trust it just kind of to promote their uh, agenda. But we ran another study, which was exactly the same, but we told them at the beginning, or half the people we told at the beginning, that we were gonna share their responses with Facebook in order to help determine what content was shown online. And we found that although that did increase polarization political polarization of responses a little bit, um, it wasn't much of an effect. And more importantly, the effects were symmetric, such that when you sort of collapse and just take an average rating, they cancel out. Like the Democrats trust the left-leaning sites a little bit more and the Republicans trust the right-leaning sites a little bit more. And then you average those things and it just washes out. So it suggests that this, algorithm, this approach is not actually very susceptible to people gaming their responses. Um, and finally, uh, the one thing that is a pretty serious limitation of this approach as it's uh, implemented here is we found that people overwhelmingly distrusted sites that they had not heard of before, that they said they were unfamiliar with, which makes sense as kind of you start, if I haven't heard about it, it's probably not reputable, but it can earn my, um, it can earn my trust. And so downranking content from distrusted outlets is going to punish sites that are actually reputable, but people don't know about either because they're new or because they're niche. And so if Facebook, uh, you know, in implementing a, a policy like this, I would advocate that rather than just serving, surveying people about their trust judgments, first show them a few uh, sort of recent well-performing articles from each source and then ask how much they trust the source. So do a little familiarization and other work that we've done suggests that that would actually be pretty effective in getting people to identify low versus high quality sources. And um, this also ties back into 
uh, the result that I mentioned before about how emphasizing the source doesn't actually affect people's trust uh, judgments that much. And, uh, the, or sorry, emphasizing the source of a headline doesn't affect whether people rate that headline as accurate or not, which seems surprising. Um, and our research suggests that the reason for that is because there's actually a lot of uh, agreement between how much they trust the source and just how face value uh, plausible the headline seems. So if you look at the ratings of accuracy of the headline without knowing the source, they're very strongly correlated with judgments of the outlet. So basically, reputable outlets produce headlines that are pretty obviously true, and disreputable head outlets produce headlines that are pretty obviously not true. And so emphasizing the source doesn't really provide much new information. Okay, so this actually seems pretty good. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to talk about is an idea that I haven't heard uh, anyone really discussing, but that our research suggests could be really promising. So in the first part of the talk, uh, I argued that falling for political misinformation on social media is more about people not paying attention and failing to engage in reasoning than it is about them sort of willfully tricking themselves. And we also have other data that suggests that even though people do to some extent care about accuracy, when they're making decisions about what to share on social media, accuracy is very far from the top of the list. And they're more thinking about you know, how, how my follower is gonna like this, how, how does it make me feel, so on and so forth. And so if you put those two things together, it suggests that if you can nudge people to pay attention to the accuracy of the content that they're reading, that might lead them to actually be more discerning in their sharing, because they can actually figure out what's good uh, content if they pay attention. And I'm stipulating, or I'm, I'm sort of postulating, let's say, that people don't actually want to share um, false content, it's just that they're not paying attention. And I'll, this, this experimental data will sort of test that, uh, that contention. So uh, we've run uh, a few different studies assessing this. I'll tell you about one of them. In this one, we recruited 1,500 Americans um, and had them, for 24 different headlines, say how likely they would be to share the headline. And again, these are all headlines taken from social media, half of them good for the Democrats, half of them good for the Republicans. And so in the control condition, it looked like this. We just showed them the headline. We say, if you were to see the above article on Facebook, how likely would you be to share it? Um, and if you look at uh, the fraction of people that say they would be likely to share it, so say the fraction of people above the midpoint in that scale, in the control, about 30% of the people, uh, or about 30% of the headlines, um, let me say different. Now. In the control, for each headline, uh, on average, about 30% of people said they would be likely to share it if it was false, and maybe 34% if it's true. So people are only slightly more likely to say that they would share true headlines compared to false headlines. And then the treatment, everything was exactly the same for the, as in the control, but at the beginning of the study, we tried to make the concept of accuracy top of mind for them. And the way that we did it is we asked them to help us pretest an item for a different uh, study where we just had them rate the accuracy of a single non-political headline. Um, and then they went on to complete exactly the same task, but the idea is because they rated the accuracy of that one headline, when they're now making their sharing decisions, they're more likely to be thinking about accuracy. And so if they really care about accuracy, they'll be more likely to take it into account in their uh, what headlines they consider sharing. And indeed, what we see is there's a small increase in the likelihood of them, uh, of, of the fraction of people saying that they would share true headlines. And there's a pretty substantial decrease in the fraction of people saying that they would consider sharing false headlines. Um, so there's like a 20% decrease uh, in the fraction of people saying they'd share false headlines. And this more than doubles their discernment. So it more than doubles the difference in sharing likelihood between true and false. Um, and uh, so, you know, we have these, this data from survey experiments, and now is similarly to how in the first part of the talk we had people do surveys and then we tried to look at this actually in the wild, uh, we're in the process of running uh, a set of field experiments on Twitter. But before I tell you about that, I want to just support this, uh, this motivating um, assumption that I made or assertion that I made, which is that people don't purposely share uh, misinformation in general. 
So we ask them at the end of the survey, how important is it to you that you only share news articles on Facebook if they're accurate? And what we found was that in both the control and the treatment, almost all the subjects said it was either very or extremely important to only share articles that are accurate, even those people who just two minutes before said they would sh consider sharing lots of false headlines. So I think it's not that by and large people are purposely sharing content they know is false, it's just that they're not thinking about it. And as I said, we're now in the, ser in the process of running some large scale Twitter field experiments we find users on Twitter who actually have been retweeting misinformation, so links from, from disreputable news outlets, and then we send them a message just asking them to judge the accuracy of a neutral headline, something like this. says, how accurate is this headline? It's some random, in this case, uh, health-related uh, headline that we ask in the text, you know, can you do me a favor? I'm wondering how accurate this headline is. I'm doing a survey to find out. What do you think? Basically, nobody responds to the message, but that's fine because as long as they just read that top sentence, even if they immediately close out of it at that point, they will have received the treatment of being induced to think a little bit about accuracy. And what we do is we send this message to a large set of people and we randomize the day in which we send the message to any given person so we can do real causal inference about the effect uh, of receiving the message. And then we examine the quality of the links um, that they share in their subsequent tweets after having gotten this message. And this is work in progress, so I can't give a, a final conclusion on this, but the preliminary results look promising. Um, and if this worked, I think it would be great because it would be very easy for social media platforms to implement. They could just have little dialogue boxes that pop up from now, uh, now and again, asking people to rate the accuracy of random headlines. I mean, and a very plausible cover story would be, see, help us inform our algorithms. How accurate do you think this story is? And then they could use the data or they could actually even just throw it away. And just asking people the question makes the concept of accuracy top of mind for them. And of course, people start ignoring pop-ups pretty easily, so they have to be creative in sort of varying the way in which they ask it so people don't get bored. But I think those are sort of practical, practical problems that social media platforms are good at dealing with. So just to conclude, um, I think that the two approaches that have received the most attention so far having, you know, partnering with professional fact checkers to identify bad content and emphasizing the source or the credibility of sources uh, are not really going to be particularly effective solutions, or at least let's say they're not going to be enough uh, to solve the problem. And we need other approaches. And then our data suggests that lay people are actually substantially better um, at assessing the quality of content um, than you might expect, uh, at least as when you get them to actually think about accuracy. Um, and so this suggests a couple of, uh, of approaches that have gotten less attention. One is using crowdsource judgments because layperson trust judgments are actually quite discerning. Um, and then also nudging people to pay attention to accuracy, making accuracy salient, and therefore getting uh, people to themselves elect to not share low quality content. And what I like about these uh, interventions is they're scalable and they're also uh, to a substantial extent behavioral. Um, that is, it leverages what we understand about the human mind and the human capacities to help uh, deal with the problem. They're not purely algorithmic. Um, and most importantly, they don't rely on some centralized authority, be it Mark Zuckerberg or President Trump or someone else, getting to decide what is true content and what is false content and what should be censored and what should not be censored. Um, so I think that this is, uh, these, are, these are promising approaches that the social media platforms should really be exploring. And then I wanna conclude with one really important caveat to everything that I've talked about, which is all of the data that I've presented has been from the US with the exception of the one study from the UK. Um, and a really important step going forward on this is to see to what extent these results generalize across cultures, particularly to places that have different uh, traditions of free press um, and basic education uh, and things like that. And we're currently undertaking uh, a variety of collaborations with people in countries around the world testing the generalizability of this. So thanks so much for your attention. I just want to acknowledge that all of this work was done with my collaborator Gord Pennycook at the University of Regina um, and then various other people from my research group at MIT uh, that have helped uh, with the work. We also um, have funding from the Ethics and Governance of uh, AI Initiative.
So thanks a lot. I hope that was of interest and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and chatting about this. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, I, this is fascinating and I'm sure we're all thinking about our own news consumption and participation in social media, <laughs> you know, every yeah. day. It's uh, top so, of mind. So one funny, one funny uh, note to everybody is that hopefully attending this talk will be kind of like, like you receiving that uh, intervention um, of making the concept of accuracy salient. So when you leave this Zoom and go back to social media, you'll be more likely to be thinking about accuracy as you're uh, scrolling through your feed. Exactly, and uh, we are recording this, so we'll ask everyone to uh, share it now with everyone yes. uh, in the yeah, networks as well. <laughs> um, so great, we'll go ahead and move into our Q&A portion of the event, um, though we do have some announcements first. Um, as a reminder to our participants, you may type in your questions in the Q&A panel in the Zoom interface, uh, and I'll go ahead and share uh, some announcements while we wait for your questions to come in. So our next Sloan Alumni Online webinar will feature Bryn Panay Burkhart from the Sloan Career Development Office. Uh, she'll be speaking on April 11th on intelligent networking. And coming up in New York City, for our alumni who are interested or who are working in finance, you're invited to join MIT Sloan on April 25th for our next MIT Sloan Idea Exchange Conference, Finance Beyond Crisis. So this is a full day conference that will showcase MIT Sloan's impact on the global economy since the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, so huge impact there. Uh, and lastly, in May, we will welcome uh, Professor Joe Doyle to the program. He will discuss his work using data to root out the real causes of waste in our healthcare system. So broad range of topics, something for everyone. We hope you'll join us uh, for these programs and events. And so now uh, we will move into our Q&A portion of the program. Uh, so keep those questions coming in via the chat interface. First, again, Dave, thank you uh, for sharing your research uh, and perspectives. Um, there's certainly a large emphasis uh, being placed on individuals, um, you know, stepping forward to stepping up uh, to take ownership for paying attention and being more mindful of the accuracy of the news they're consuming and sharing. But, you know, maybe could you say a little bit um, about either government or private sector? What role uh, those types of entities can play um, in, you know, making people more mindful of accuracy? For sure. So I think most of the work that we've been doing has been focused on private sector interventions. That is things that social media companies could do themselves, a policy that they could implement to try and improve things. Um, and it's a kind of, you know, sort of, we're trying to understand how individuals think about that and then think, given that, what can the, the social media platforms do? And in terms of the government, in terms of government, uh, I find the argument that social media companies are utilities pretty convincing. Um, and so I certainly think uh, there is a place for regulation. The thing that I've come to appreciate, though, as I've spent more and more time uh, working on this is at first blush, it seems like a pretty simple problem of, oh, there's just bad content. Say, well, don't, you know, don't have bad content on the platform. And just, that seems easy enough to regulate. Say, well, if there's bad content on the platform, then you have some negative consequences. But as I've spent more time with it, I've come to appreciate how amazingly hard this problem is, both from a kind of intellectual or, or philosophical pr uh, perspective in terms of identifying what is bad content. And then also just from a purely practical perspective, Facebook has this vast amount of data uh, that's organized in like a very disorganized way. And it's, it's, it's not at all easy to sort of, even for Facebook to really understand what's going on. Um, and so I'm nervous about the ability of external regulators to do a good job in understanding what is going on um, and how to effectively regulate. Um, which is not to say that it shouldn't happen. It's just, I think it's a really serious challenge and that uh, great care should be taken in figuring out uh, ways to implement things that will actually be helpful and not harmful. Yeah, and that echoes a uh, follow-up kind of question or comment we had, um, you know, who checks the fact checkers? Uh, so <laughs> certainly uh, a conundrum there. Uh, and I guess actually just as, as, a, as a, a small reply on that, because certainly fact checkers are not infallible, 
And there is a, a pretty strong perception in this country, at least among a lot of people uh, on the right, that fact checkers have a liberal bias and are biased against uh, conservative outlets. Um, but our data suggests that actually uh, there is a very high degree of agreement between lay people and professional fact checkers. Um, and so the, the way that I had sort of emphasized this or framed this in the talk was this shows that the layperson trust judgments are actually better than you would expect because they're highly correlated with the fact checkers. But the flip side of that is to say, yeah, this shows that the fact checkers actually are doing a good job of representing the general will of the American public rather than being heavily biased in one direction or the other. Great, thank you. Um, so a question that has come in, um, you know, and maybe you could comment on this. So how does your research explain people holding beliefs that um, might go against scientific fact? So the question specifically referenced um, kind of anti-vaxxing or the flat earth movement, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question, the sort of how what we are finding in these sort of political headlines that go viral on social media, how that connects to other different kinds of false beliefs. Um, and there is at least some evidence that in the context of things like climate change or gun control, um, uh, well, let's say, let's focus on climate change because there, there's a very clear scientific consensus and yet a large fraction of people in the US uh, don't agree with it. Um, and in the context of climate change, things look a bit different from what you see in the results that we presented. We find that uh, in general, um, people that engage in more reasoning, rather than being more likely to, uh, to believe in human-caused climate change, which is the scientific consensus, uh, they're more polarized. So in particular, among conservatives, a greater degree of reasoning is associated with less belief in uh, human cause uh, climate change. And so I think one of the big puzzles that we are uh, working on right now is trying to understand what are the differences between things like climate change on the one hand, where uh, reasoning does kind of lead to polarization versus uh, political fake news on social media, where it seems like reasoning leads just to accuracy. And my current working hypothesis is essentially that um, and we have some data to support this idea that people that engage in more reasoning, uh, when they evaluate a new piece of information, they rely more on what they already uh, know about the world, which in general makes sense because how do you figure out if something is, you know, is true or not? You evaluate it in the sense of, in context of everything else you know. Um, but that means in, in situations like climate change where there is a reasonable amount of ambiguity and you can find uh, you know, some pieces of evidence to support uh, whatever you want to believe, there's intellectual wiggle room for smart, cognizant people to trick themselves into not agreeing with the scientific consensus, whereas the kind of uh, content that tends to go viral on social media is uh, usually, like, part, part of what makes content go viral is it seeming kind of crazy and out there that makes it exciting and sort of shareable, but it also makes it so that you, in general, can pretty easily tell if you just look at it that that's probably not true. So I think that in those contexts, people don't have enough intellectual wiggle room to deceive themselves if they're kind of engaging in thinking, whereas in the more complicated uh, things like climate change, uh, and my guess is that anti-vaxxing is in a similar category, um, uh, it, things are more complicated with respect to reasoning. And I've seen some research suggesting in the anti-vaxxing context in particular that uh, one of the more effective ways to get people to um, be more pro-vaxxing is just to describe and show pictures of and stuff like that, the bad health outcomes that can occur if you actually get the disease in question. I think it kind of connects with people in a more visceral way of like, oh, wow, okay, that actually really would be bad. Maybe I shouldn't mess around here. Right, it's the trigger for um, that classical reasoning <laughs> to spend some more time thinking about it. Um, so another question that came in, uh, have you examined how more aggressive or hyperbolic headlines um, contribute to news sharing? I know we all have experience seeing clickbait articles or any comment uh, on that? Yeah, so, um, 
We, have, uh, we haven't done that much um, on that particular question, but another person at Sloan, Sanan Aral, had a, a very impactful paper last year looking at the spread of false versus true rumors on Twitter. Um, and their results basically uh, showed um, that, well, what they found was headlines that were more unusual, that is more sort of different from other headlines you had seen previously, were more likely to get shared. And so they make this argument that part of the reason that false content spreads uh, better than, uh, like really spreads well, sometimes better than equivalent uh, true content, is because it is more surprising and novel. And then we actually have some experimental results uh, that support that where we show that if you show someone a headline um, in, in a first stage, as I told you during the talk, that makes them subsequently believe it more. But we also ask them if they would be, uh, if they would share it on social media or not. And we find that getting familiarized with the content, even though it makes you believe it more, it makes you say you would share it less. Um, and so I think that that's part of what the sensationalism does is it makes it kind of stick out, seem different from uh, normal content. So seem, make you want to share it, even though it also means if you thought about it a little, that's the same kind of thing that makes you realize it's not true on reflection. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, we're nearing the top of the hour. So I want to close with the last question. So um, hopefully, hoping you can uh, tell our viewers, what are you working on now uh, that you're most excited about and kind of what's next? Uh, so we're pursuing a bunch of different uh, things in this particular space. Um, and so one thing that I mentioned in the talk at the end is we're really working on these Twitter field experiments, trying to do actual interventions in the real world using the things that we're learning in these survey experiments. So, so I find that very exciting, both from a trying to generate actual impact perspective and from a methodological perspective. We're developing these new tools for doing digital experiments um, that have all of the same ability to draw causal inference as traditional lab experiments, but are done actually on platform um, such that you can influence real behavior in the real world. Um, and we're also evaluating various other uh, potential interventions. Um, and, and more generally, I'm trying to do basic science, just getting a better understanding of what determines which uh, statements people believe versus disbelieve and the role that reasoning plays, trying to reconcile things like climate change with uh, the political misinformation on social media, and trying to sort of come up with an, uh, a cohesive theory of how uh, beliefs are formed and updated um, and how you can intervene on them. Great. Well, thank you, Dave. And we look forward to hearing more about the impact of your work. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for Sloan Alumni Online. I'd also like to thank all of our viewers for joining us. To keep this conversation going over social media, you can use the hashtag Sloaney Chat. Following this event, you'll receive a survey via email as well as a link to the recording. So for all of our viewers, please fill that out and let us know your feedback on this session as well as our ongoing lineup of events. As always, you can reach out to us at Sloan Alumni Online at MIT.edu. Thanks for joining us today. And Dave, thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate having you on the program. Thanks so much for having me. This was uh, my pleasure.